Mask off, glasses on. <laughs> but the glasses might come off too. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury on a very special Sunday. Today we mark the 200th anniversary of this church, which was organized in the Great Plains section of Danbury on December 9th, 1822, as the first Universalist Society. My name is Doug Parkhurst. Some of you know me, and some probably do not, though you may recognize my name as I am the author of the history-oriented articles which have been appearing in the congregation newsletter, comment during 2022. My wife, Mary Lou, who rang the chimes, and I joined this church, and as we signed the book in 1991, 31 years ago. And for the first 15 years, we're regular attendees and involved in a variety of church-related activities. Then in 2006, we moved from Danbury to Southern Vermont, too far away to be here each Sunday or to attend weeknight meetings and most other activities. We have maintained our memberships though, as the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury is the first UU church either of us was associated with. Mary Lou as an adult in the early 1990s, and I starting as an infant in 1952. So if you can add in your head, you can figure out how old I am. <laughs> the Parker side of my family was active during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in what was then known as the First Universalist Church, at that time located at 347 Main Street in Danbury, a few doors south of the railroad tracks. There's an office building there now where that building was. I was christened, I was nurseried, I was Sunday schooled, and for a while I was youth grouped. And at that time the youth group was called LRY which stood for liberal religious youth while growing up. Then I was away to college and other interests and activities from my late teens to my late thirties. Today we are celebrating 200 continuous years of service to Danbury and for a time, the Ridgefield and West Reading or Reading communities. What I believe that means is we in fact are celebrating 200 years of us you and me, and all those who have come before us. We are fortunate to have two talented and energetic members of the clergy now serving our congregation, Reverend Kathleen Rudolph and Reverend Sierra Marie Grafeo. I don't know if Sierra Marie is here. Oh, okay. Prior to their coming, 
Approximately 60 clergy have been associated with this church over a period of two centuries. Many were settled, settled ministers. Some were circuit riders. In the old days, they called them circuit riders. Others were part-timers. Uh, some have been called consulting ministers in the modern era. I guess you're officially a consulting minister. Or interim ministers. We now have a minister of religious education. Uh, we've had supply ministers. And we've had a community minister here in recent years. Again, if you can do a quick calculation in your head, you can figure out that 60 ministers or approximately 60 ministers in 200 years means an average tenure of three to four years per minister. There are exceptions to that, but three to four years has been the average. As the clergy have come and gone, faithful lay people have persisted through the good times, the difficult times, through the ups and the downs. Among those faithful members, continuing members today, are, and I think I saw them, I see them over there, Keith and Marie Dupree, who signed our membership book 52 years ago in January of 1970, and they're still active today. I think Marie is still counting pennies. <laughs> Uh, Mike and Barbara Searing, who moved south several years ago after retirement, signed the book back in 1973. And both of them were active members until they moved away. There are those who have been here approximately four decades, more or less 40 years. I'll give you some names. Now, the nature of this kind of work is that we always forget somebody. So if I miss you, and I should have said your name in any of these categories that are coming up, or this category. Forgive me, I apologize in advance. Um, among the 40 year members, or four decade more or less members, Gail Alexander, and the Alexander family has been attending here since the 1960s. Bob Bollinger, I think I saw Bob. So there's Bob. Hi, Bob. Donna Lawrence, Janet Swift, Joanne Davidson, I know she's here because I was talking to her, there she is, Jane Leff, and I think, yeah, Jane is here, Barbara Myers, uh, not Barbara's here, I saw her yesterday. We remember others in this category who have passed away in recent years and obviously are not with us. Jean Rangelian, Bill McWilliams, Jack and Kathy Charles, Ross Fenster, George and June Volkhausen, Eleanor and Seabury Lyon, Ann Thorpe, Sally Flato. Growing up, I remember other pillars of our church, the Olmsted family, Taylor family, Spike Albert, Frank and Sally Rollins, Edith Ritten, the Vogel family, Arthur Olson. Then there was Bessie Jackson. She was a little lady who stood about this tall, bright red hair. She and her husband Ralph lived up on Hoyt Street near the, uh, near the firehouse on Hoyt Street. Bessie signed the book in 1908 and was still active in the 1960s. And actually, I believe that she went with the church when it first moved down to West Reading in the early 70s. But she was a, an old lady by then. But I think she did attend for a while in West Reading. Well, do you remember Bessie Jackson? No? A place of honor in our memories is held by Adelaide Graber. This name is probably familiar to many of you. Adelaide Graber was associated with our group for about 70 years. She started with the church about 1891, when the church was located, the building was located on Liberty Street, east of Maine in downtown Danbury. She started out as the assistant organist. 
and starting in 1897, she became the organist and choir director. She held these positions for 64 years until 1961, when she retired at the age of 90. And of course, there are others who go back to the early 20th and the 19th centuries. Their last names were familiar ones in Danbury and in this church. And some of you, there may be people here who are related to these families or descendants. Uh, the last names are Hubble, some of the last names. Hubble, Stuckey, Peck, Andrews, Scott, Fanton, Bates, Foster, Dibble, Hurlbut, Ambler. And there are others too. As I said, I'll, I've probably missed some. I've probably gone over time here in this welcome, and this is a little bit of a different welcome than we usually hear. But there's a couple more things I need to say to you. And if you are with us today online, that is if you're sitting in the electronic balcony, <laughs> which is actually when Mary Lou and I attend nowadays, that's usually where we are, we're sitting in the electronic balcony. Uh, we invite you to share your name and where you are from in the chat box on the website. Uh, usually we just ask new people or visitors for the first time to do that. But since this is a really special day, maybe it would be interesting to see where people have come from who are watching and listening and who they are. At the conclusion of, a day, of today's service, look for a breakout room where you might continue here, <coughs> excuse me, where you might continue your visit. If you are a new visitor in person, please fill out a visitor card near the exit door or the entrance door, if you haven't done so, and consider staying for a few more minutes for coffee and conversation after the service. And I've been given two announcements to read. First of all, today we welcome the Reverend Lawrence Smith as our guest speaker. The Reverend Lawrence Smith was appointed Director of Stewardship and Development at the Unitarian Universalist Association, or UUA, in February of, uh, February of 2019. And I understand you have forebears from the first parish in Cambridge, Mass, which is a venerable Unitarian heritage church. She oversees the UUA's fundraising efforts, including annual program fund contributions from member con congregations. The UUA is watching. <laughs> Second, the 200th anniversary brunch uh, will be held today and you are invited to stay after the service for a special campus rededication followed by brunch in the fellowship hall. A fun UUCD trivia game will take place during the brunch. Again, welcome everyone to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury. And remember, celebrate you today. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Good morning. Good morning. Happy anniversary. <laughs> Good morning online. Let's all just turn, wave. We don't know, I don't know how many are on there, but we are glad you're with us because this is a very special day and it would not be the same were you not with us today because you too are a part of our community, whether we're in person or you're joining us online. We have one very special announcement um, from our senior high youth. And I think, Jazz, are you going to come and share that announcement? I don't know if any of your cohorts going to join you so you don't have to stand here all alone. <laughs> That's a no. <laughs> Let's make sure this is on. Yep. Hello, my name is Jazz Liotta. I am a member of the senior high youth group. Um, I just wanted to come up here and let you guys know that on October 30th, which is two weeks from now, I believe, after the service, we will be hosting a trunk or treat. So I hope you guys all come. It's for all ages. We encourage costumes. They're not mandatory, but 
definitely recommended. And um, I hope you guys all come. It will be fun. Thank you, Jazz. Thank you, Senior High Youth, for including us older children in your <laughs> trunk or treat. That's wonderful. It is so good for us to be together today. I know in addition to Reverend Lauren Smith, and I want to encourage you, if you have an order of service or online, you were sent that in your link, take a look at, uh, at her bio. It is not only interesting, it's actually really inspiring. And to know that she is here with us today to bring a message on this very special day. Um, we are honored and we're grateful for your presence. Um, so let's take a really quick moment. First of all, just look around. Just stay in your seats, just kind of look around. Do you see some faces you haven't seen in a while? Faces you have never seen before? Could be. We've got a mix here today. I know we're gonna have two people from the community and I'm not sure that they are here yet. Lorianne Morrissey. Lorianne Morrissey, could you stand for just a moment, Lorianne? Lorianne is from the Dorothy Day Hospitality House, part of our community connections. We are grateful for your presence here with us today. Thank you. Also, um, Nellie Jara, are you here yet? Not yet, from Connecticut Workers Center in Bridgeport will also be with us today. So we wanna make sure that we are saying hello not only to our friends and to those maybe we haven't seen in a while, but to those we don't know. So rather than us getting up and moving around because we're a nice big group today, if you can just take a second, just a second to maybe turn to your right, your left, in front of you and back of you, just say good morning. I'm glad you're here. I want to encourage you to continue the conversations and meeting and greeting one another uh, during our brunch. Let me just give you, if you listen, let me give you a little heads up on how it's going to work as soon as the service is over. And once we hear the beautiful posted from Jerry, all of those except in the setup crew. And you know, if you signed up for setup and I sent you an email, everyone else, I'm going to ask you to join me outside in front of the deck at the cottage for our rededication ceremony. And during that time, we'll have setup crew getting this room all prepared and ready for us to come back in and enjoy our brunch together. I'll remind you, but this way you have some idea of, of what's coming up and what's happening. Right now, let's rise in body or spirit as you are able and sing together our hymn of welcome. It is morning has come. It's the very first one, and I can tell you it happens to be the favorite hymn of our infamous Jerry Phelps. So let's raise our voices and sing together, Morning Has Come. Morning has come, arise and greet the day. Dance with joy and sing a song of gladness. The light of hope here shines upon each face. May it bring faith to guide our journey home. A new day dawns, once more the gift is given. Wonder feels this moment shared together. The light of peace here shines upon each face. May it bring faith to guide our journey forward. Open your eyes to see that life abounds. Open hearts to welcome among us. The light of love here shines upon each face. May it bring faith to guide our journey forward. Thank you. You may be seated. 
I'd like to invite the president of our board of trustees, Margaret Henderson, to come and light our chalice this morning. And as Margaret does that, I will lead us in the chalice lighting affirmation. You can see the words printed on the screen. It's also in the order of service. And we are going to wait until Margaret actually lights the chalice and then share these words together. And Reverend Kathleen promised to do my favorite thing and emphasize the first word of the chalice light. That's why we're waiting. together. Love is the spirit of this congregation, and justice is its light. This is our covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek and speak the truth in love, to help one another and celebrate life. All right, let's say together our children's affirmation. We are Unitarian Universalists. We are people with open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. We care for the earth and each other. I want to invite my helpers for the story forward. I wonder if there is anyone here who can remember the story I told last winter, last winter, with Lego people and a boat. Anybody remember that? And who was that story about? John Murray. It was the story of the minister, John Murray, and then the farmer, Thomas Potter. <laughs> So if you weren't here then or you don't remember, no worries. I have a couple of helpers here, and I am going to have those who do remember help me give you the two-minute version. The story is that universalism began to, spread, to be spread on these shores when the broken-hearted minister, John Murray came by boat across from England in 1770, and the boat he was in got stuck on a sandbar in New Jersey where he met the farmer Thomas Potter, who was a deeply spiritual man who believed that, now this is the part where those of you who remember the story can help me, he believed that God loves who? Everyone. He believed that God loves all people, not just some, and that the kingdom of God is for who? Everyone. Everyone. That's right, for all people, not just some. And it turned out that John Murray shared this belief with Thomas Potter. So Thomas Potter said, you are the minister I have been waiting for. <laughs> Come preach in the little chapel I've built on my farm. But the story goes, John Murray didn't plan to preach again because he had come to start over after his many heartbreaks. And he told Thomas Potter that he couldn't preach because he was going to leave for New York as soon as the wind changed and his boat got unstuck. So Thomas Potter then said, if the wind hasn't changed by Sunday, then will you come preach? And John Murray agreed. So, of course, what happens? <laughs> Help me out here. You remember the story, right? What did you say? No wind. The wind did not change. So John Murray preached the universal love of God in Thomas Potter's cha chapel, and it changed him, John Murray. John Murray was inspired to preach again, traveling around and bringing the universalist message of God's love for all people wherever he went. So now the helpers can take a seat, and we're going to expand on the story. Thank you, John Murray and Thomas Potter. Here's where we get to expand. We know that John Murray traveled and preached throughout New England, 
So we're just gonna pretend New England's over here, right? We're in New England, but we're just gonna pretend when I point there. And all the way down to the coast, of, uh, uh, down the coast to Virginia. So there is a chance, right? That he might have even preached here in Danbury or in one of the neighboring towns, but we don't know for sure. What we do know is that no movement, no really big thing happens because of just one person, just one person alone. Even if John Murray never made it out here, the same ideas pop up all around in different places at the same time. How can we make some popping noises? Yes, with hands snapping or clapping or mouths. Yes. So we could have pops all over because this idea that God loves all people, which wasn't being taught in the churches during this time, was starting to pop up in many different places. Sometimes people call this kind of thing the zeitgeist. That's a word that means the mood or the spirit or ideas that are in a point in history all over the place. Instead of pops, actually, we could think about this as wind. Sometimes wind blows from one place to another, whoosh. And sometimes wind will come up whoosh, in one place and also come up whoosh, in another place at the exact same time without blowing back and forth. So instead of popping, maybe we could say whoosh. Yes. OK. So we know that those around New England where these Unitarian, where these Universalist ideas, make that one sound with me, whoosh, were whooshing all around. We know that that was happening during this time. 37 years after John Murray was stuck on a standbar in New Jersey and 15 years before this congregation was founded to celebrate the news that God's love is for who? Everyone. Everyone. There must have been universalists already in the area because the 1807 universalist general convention was held, guess where? Close, close, in Newtown, <laughs> in Newtown. And then during the convention, the well-known universalist preacher, Hosea Ballou, preached in Danbury. And it may be that the wind had just been blowing here for a long time before this congregation started. Someone named Josiah Dykeman was ordained as a universalist minister in the Hudson Valley of New York State in 1821. He was from Danbury. That was the year before the Kent congregation was founded. So I guess we can add whoosh, a whoosh for Hudson Valley, too. A lot of this belief that God's love is for, come on now, for people, everyone, was in the Great Plain area of Danbury. Now, those of you who are from Danbury will have to tell me because I'm lost in space all of the time. Are we in the Great Plain area? No. no, got it, okay. So this was a farming area of Danbury at the time. And this was, this was one of the places that lots of universalist ideas popped up or, or whooshed in. And on December 9th, 1822, in the Great Plain, this congregation was formed by 12 people who started meeting in homes and barns and a schoolhouse and maybe even outside sometimes. But you know, even though the wind was blowing, that didn't mean that universalism was accepted. There's even a story of one person who at first, before he became a proud universalist, would travel through swamps and fields so his neighbors and friends wouldn't see him going to church because they knew that he, they would, he knew that they wouldn't approve. Many people believed then, just as some people believe now, that teaching that God's love is for everyone, that the kingdom of God is for everyone, 
would be a dangerous idea because for one thing, they say, if you aren't afraid of God, what's going to make you behave in the right ways? Yet in this congregation, we understand even now that knowing we are loved, knowing that we are loved in a way that can never be taken from us, knowing that we are beloved, means that we also know that everyone else is too. And that makes it the most natural thing, the most natural thing in the world, to want to be good to one another, to want to make this world a better place. This legacy from the founding of this congregation carries on in this way through today, to today. And this ends the story. Let's sing together this little light of mine and anybody who wants to, any of the kids who want to come outside can come downstairs with me and we'll go through that downstairs to get there. Let's take a moment to be in silence together, to hold those joys, to hold whatever sorrows and concerns you have brought here with you in this moment. Let's be together in silence. In the spirit of reflection, let us sing together. I know this rose will open. The words will be right up there on the screen. We're going to sing it two times through. I know this rose will open. I know my fear will burn away. I know my soul will unfurl its wings. I know this rose will open. I know this rose will open. I know my fear will burn away. I know my soul will unfurl its wings. I know this rose will open. Good morning. It is so good to be with you today as you celebrate your 200th anniversary. It's thrilling and I'm really honored to have been invited. Thank you so much. And I bring greetings and congratulations myself, but also on behalf of our UUA president, our Unitarian Universalist Association president, uh, the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, and also on behalf of all of the sibling congregations that form our association. Um, together we celebrate with you. This morning's service was inspired by my colleague, 
our colleague, the Reverend Susan Moran. Reverend Susan used to open every service she led with the same words. This is the day we have been given. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Susan's choice was especially poignant because she'd been through quite a lot. When I met her, her husband had been dead for just over a year, the victim of a sudden unexpected heart attack. She was raising her two young girls alone and navigating her own expansive grief. And yet she began always with gratitude and a call to joy, her own variation on the words of the 118th Psalm. This is the day we have been given. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So in that spirit, I offer you as the opening reading uh, a poem from Billy Collins. This is Days. Each one is a gift, no doubt, mysteriously placed in your waking hand or set upon your forehead moments before you open your eyes. Today begins cold and bright, the ground heavy with snow and the thick masonry of ice, the sun glinting off the turrets of clouds. Through the calm eye of the window, everything is in its place, but so precariously, this day might be resting somehow on the one before it. All the days of the past stacked high like the impossible tower of dishes entertainers used to build on stage. No wonder you find yourself perched on the top of a tall ladder hoping to add one more. Just another Wednesday, you whisper. Then holding your breath, place this cup on yesterday's saucer without the slightest clink. This congregation has been around for 200 years, due in large part to the generosity of all of those who have been a part. So as we take this morning's offering, I invite you to consider all those who have come before you, all of those who have shared their generosity to keep this congregation alive, to keep it going, to keep us striving towards living out our mission. So if you are online, you can see the QR code and you can uh, give generously there. You can also send a check to UUCD here on Clapper Ridge Road. So I invite our greeters to prepare to accept this morning's offering. And I encourage you to consider the generosity of 200 years.
In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. That's a line I learned, uh, a line from a song I learned one summer out on Star Island, our beautiful Unitarian Universalist Conference Center off the coast of New Hampshire in Maine. The spirit of the song and the harmony break open on the words, it is time now. It is time now that we thrive. It is time now, and what a time to be alive. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. What a time to be alive. What a time to be a religious community entering a fresh century of its ministry. Like many of you, I stay abreast of current events. Over the past few years, I have watched a pandemic explode in our midst. I saw long-standing racial injustice burst into public consciousness and then continue unabated and then expand. I saw the nation's capital overrun by insurrectionists, have witnessed threats to democracy at home and abroad that shake me to my core. Vladimir Putin's re reckless invasion of Ukraine and relentless attacks on voting rights here in the United States. Assaults on LGBTQ people have reached fever pitch and every summer my dear home state of California has burned. What a time to be alive. In such a time, what does it mean to be a religious community? What does it mean to lead in love? My daughter, Aaliyah, who's now seven, offered me some wise instruction on this subject when she was just three years old. Aaliyah is a sunny, loving person, and she also has always had a singular way of speaking. When she was small, she would latch onto certain words and infuse them with her own shades of meaning. For a while, she was especially fond of the word choice. If, for example, my husband suggested that they go out for hot cocoa, Aaliyah would nod approvingly and say, that will be a good choice. <laughs> and if I informed her that it was time for her nap, she was apt to bellow, no, that will be a bad choice. <laughs> One of the beautiful things about living with a toddler is that you always know where you stand. <laughs> Aaliyah also bestowed nicknames liberally, and they were often relational. Like she would, I would be Mama Bird, and she would be a Baby Bird, or Mama Peanut and Girl Peanut. And there's a book series by children's author Mo Willems about an elephant named Gerald and his best friend Piggy. After her first encounter with one of these books, Aaliyah decided that I should henceforth be known as Gerald Princess instead of Mama and she would like to be known as Piggy Chickworm. <laughs> this is all very important backstory if you are to understand the conversation that took place between us one morning before we sat down to breakfast. Aaliyah was sitting at the dining room table and she turned to me and said, I love you, Gerald Princess, and I love our whole family. I was singularly stressed that morning, but I looked back at her and I just melted. I love you too, Piggy Chickworm. And I love our whole family too. That will be a good choice, said Aaliyah. <laughs> and then she paused and she pointed to a blank piece of paper on the table and said, let's put our love choices right there. And then she did, tapping the paper with her fingertips and saying, Put, 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 put. She said, let's put our love choices right there. And then she did. Put, 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 put. My daughter's words were a clear teaching for me about leadership, about ministry and love. Sometimes it's so much simpler than we make it. Faithful leadership, faithful ministry, whether by a person or a congregation or a community, requires that we choose a path of love, a path with heart. Effective leadership demands that we manifest that love in wise and concrete ways, that we choose to give our love where it's needed. This is a delicate moment in Unitarian Universalism. 
a time of great risk and opportunities for faith communities that have been strained to near breaking by the challenges of the last few years. But congregations matter. It matters that faith communities are here to shelter all of us who have been buffeted by life and who still want to make the world a better place. All of us who need comfort and inspiration to live fully into our days. You matter. You Unitarian Universalist congregation of Danbury matter. I have read your history. There is a lot of wisdom in this community about resilience and perseverance. There is a lot of wisdom about what it means to co-create a culture of mutual care and support. You know a lot about resilience and you clearly know a lot about love. This year, 2022, the 200th anniversary of your founding is also a critical year in society. It's an election year in a time of massive threats to people, communities, and the planet. Our democratic institutions shelter the well-being and opportunity of millions of Americans and impact the lives of people all over the world. Our democratic institutions produce policy that can protect or destroy the natural world. I know your mission uh, mentions sustainability, and that's beautiful to me. Let's put our love choices where it matters, into the communities and into the institutions and into the earth that holds us. Leadership and love are first and foremost a choice, a decision to accept the circumstances we have been handed, a decision to respond to those circumstances with imagination and care. A few years ago, my husband Chris and I went to see the Broadway show Hamilton in New York thanks to the generosity of my brother and my sister-in-law, best Christmas present ever. There's a line in that show that becomes a motif. Angelica Schuyler sings it first. She's the daughter of a wealthy, influential man in colonial America, and she is captivated by the revolution. She and her sisters, Eliza and Peggy, enter the stage. Eliza and Peggy sing about the danger in the city, the chaos associated with civil unrest and impending war. But Angelica sings, look around, look around, look around at how lucky we are to be alive right now. History is happening in Manhattan. It takes a special kind of spirit to look around in a time of danger and uncertainty and see opportunity and feel calling. We're at a watershed moment in our faith and in history. We're at an inflection point, a crossroads. Our choices will determine our future. Your choices will determine our future. Not so much your choices about how to think, but your choices about how to be and act. The choices you make about how to show up for and with others. The choice to listen deeply and share honestly, to seek and speak the truth in love, the choice to restore relationships and reconstitute communities, the choice to be global citizens. This moment demands that you, that we move fully into the prophetic and pastoral role of the church, that we accept the gifts of this day even the most painful gifts, and choose to lead in love. You begin by getting clear about what you value. I value strong communities, resilient communities, capable of facing challenges with resourcefulness, fidelity, collaboration, creativity, and joy. I value the power of strong communities to hold and heal people and call us forward towards service and connection. You are crossing the threshold of a fresh century. This is a precious moment for celebration and for reflection and for renewal. This time of receding pandemic and changing ministry is an opportunity to rediscover and remember your own heart. Why are you here? Who are you in the world now for one another and for your communities? Who will you be? 
This congregation was gathered 200 years ago. It was formed to be in place of inclusion and exploration, a spiritual home for free hearts and open minds. It was founded in a spirit of love and expansive welcome, rooted in the heart of your universalist beginnings. The values with which you began are clearly rooted deep here, and they have clearly held you and sustained you through many different locations in the area. And yet those same values have continually called you to change and grow along with the changing world. You continue to aspire as you always have to spiritual growth and exploration, mutual support, the advance of justice and care for the earth. But justice, freedom, and exploration look different now than they did in 1822, as it should be. The original 12 people who gathered could not have guessed that you would one day welcome the exquisite array of people and families and the exquisite variety of beliefs that, are, that now are present in this congregation. I am so thankful for all that is abiding, the through line of your ministry. I'm also grateful for all that is new and fresh and just now alive. We need you to be bold and collaborative and imaginative. We need you to show up for one another and for your widening circles of community. We need your scrappiness and your heart. Thank you also, each of you who are here, for supporting this congregation with your gifts of time and talent and treasure. It takes support of all kinds for a congregation to thrive. And if each person contributes what they can with an open heart, it will be enough. My role is at the, UUA, at the UUA is as a fundraiser, so I need to say this. I invite generosity to our association and its priorities, but everywhere I go, I tell people to give to their congregations first. Make our UU congregations strong, because congregations just like this one are the heart of our faith. We at the Unitarian Universalist Association are in your corner. We are part of a collection of congregations and people joined together. The UUA is here to partner with you and amplify the gifts of your ministry. We have three mission areas, equipping congregations for vital ministry, training leaders, and advancing UU values in the world. And we do this holding in our hearts the vision of a multicultural, multiracial, anti-oppressive association in which people of all identities thrive. This year, the UUA has chosen to advance UU values by building on the powerful momentum of the UU The Vote 2020 campaign. The ability to make progress on the issues about which we care deeply, climate justice, voting rights, human rights for immigrants, LGBTQ rights, reproductive rights, hinge significantly on the functioning of local and state and federal government. In the UU The Vote 2020 campaign, Unitarian Universalists all over the country built relationships, made phone calls, wrote letters. UUs made over 3 million contacts with prospective voters to get out the vote, register and educate people and engage in values-based conversations. Reverend Kathleen mentioned to me that this congregation is engaged in elections work, that you have been writing postcards for more than one election cycle to inspire folks to turn out and that you, and, and that you have done so um, connected with you, the vote and just out of your own priorities. I can tell you from experience how much this way of showing up matters. My family lived in New Hampshire for eight years. And New Hampshire, as you may know, is one of the, is the home of the nation's first primary, which means that we get a lot of attention from candidates. The candidates spoke at our church, at local coffee. You could, you know, just sort of run into them all over the place in town. And we were flooded with mailers, most of, most of which went straight into the recycling bin. But not the handwritten postcard from a woman in Montana, an older woman with slanted handwriting whose card I stuck to our refrigerator. It moved me that someone cared enough about our democracy to do something personal. As UUA president Susan Frederick Gray says, work like this is faithful moral action. 
we are doing at the national level, what you aspire to do here. Organize, gather together to make a difference, build skills and grow relationships. We, all of us, need to use every tool we have to protect freedom for all people, to express our affirmation of human worth and dignity by co-creating societies and communities in which all people can thrive. We do this together as an act of love, as an expression of gratitude for the sanctity and the beauty of life. What a day we have been given. What a time to be alive. Not long ago, I shared a children's book called The Journey with a group of UU kids. My first ministry was as a part-time religious educator and I cherish that. It's the story of a refugee family fleeing violence and searching for a safe new home. The plot of the story is pretty simple. A mother takes her children and flees from a war zone. They travel in secret, crossing borders, leaving pets and belongings behind, interacting with smugglers and border guards. It's a treacherous journey with many, many twists and turns. It reminded me of all the twists and turns I, I, I read in your, your history. <laughs> so many different things that you all faced and moved through. At the end of the last boat ride, the mother spots land. And as the story ends, one of the children looks up and sees a flock of migrating birds. She says, I hope one day, like those birds, we will find a new home, a home where we can be safe and begin our story again. I closed the book, and one of the kids in the class hollered out, it's a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, I said. And what is a cliffhanger? It's a story where you get to make the end yourself. Another chi child chimed in. They were brilliant. <laughs> True, I replied. And that is a lot like life. And that's one of the reasons that faith communities, that congregations like this one exist. There are stories going on all around us. Stories about the earth and people, and the endings have not yet been determined. So we come together to learn to be the people we need to be so we can help these stories end with love and fairness. We come together to learn how to be braver and kinder and wiser. We come th when, when hard things in the world break our hearts and we need consolation and encouragement. We give of ourselves to make our faith strong and vital. Thank you for all the ways you strengthen this congregation and thank you for all the ways this congregation strengthens Unitarian Universalism and our shared ministry in the world. What a day we have been given. Look around. History is happening. Let's put our love choices right there. It's time to thrive. Today and always especially in the new century that awaits you. May it be so, blessed be, and amen. I invite you to share with me in the chalice extinguishing words that you will see here. We're gonna, in just a minute, also printed in your order of service, and then I will extinguish, Margaret will extinguish the chalice for us. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. Now, Reverend Lauren chose this uh, 
hymn of celebration. And I told you she also chose the uh, the hymn of welcome, which was Jerry's favorite. And this one happens to be my favorite. So thank you for that. Uh, so let's rise in body or spirit at home. If you're watching, maybe you want to rise where you are because this song is worth our attention, our respect, the beautiful lilt of our voices. Let's sing together as a community celebrating 200 years. Come and go with me. It is number 1018 in the soft hymnal. And now I invite you to sort of reach out in spirit to one another. You know, I used to invite people to take hands, but extend your care to your right and your left and in front and behind you and out of the walls of this building. And I offer you as benediction uh, the words of the Reverend Barbara Peskin. Ministers and congregations call ourselves and each other closer to the edge where reason and risk meet. This edge is in us. It is the edge on the path that leads us out of sacred space with the holy in us. It is the edge from which we leap again and again into the unknown with greater loving and trust. This is the edge on which we walk into the world, which needs all our voices, all our passion and healing, all our love to be whole. May you go out into the waiting day held by the love and the peace of this place. May you go out into the waiting day bringing the love and the peace of this place out into the world as you move through it. Go in love this day and go in peace. Amen. Shalom. Salam. Amen. Amen. Blessed be. Blessed be. To each and all. <coughs> Namaste. Namaste.
So I invite you, unless you are on the setup crew, to please gather all of your belongings because they're gonna be moving tables and chairs and let us join together outside. We'll get a breath of fresh air right by the deck at the cottage.